I'm so thankful for all the families here. Uh, we really believe that Whitewater is a family. That means like, even if you kind of get off the reservation, like maybe some of you guys have done with your families or had kids who have kind of gone off the reservation, you're, you're in the family no matter what. You know, it, you know, it's not defined by borders. It's not defined by what you've done or haven't done. Um, our, our family here at Whitewater is defined by God's love. And God, it says, loves the world. This is a place you can belong before you believe. You can discover and go through process of learning and answering questions and, and maybe um, working through areas of hurt in your life before you even believe what we believe, and that's okay. We want, you, we want to be on the journey with you. We want to help you take the next steps. That's what our church is all about. So I'm going to um, just... To get us a uh, kickstart, I'm going to say one uh, other word of prayer just to get our hearts prepared for what God has to teach us today. If you'd bow with me. Heavenly Father, we just pray and ask that you would um, do some incredible things today. Lord, thank you for the families are, who are here, Lord. Thank you for the uncles and the aunts and the moms and dads and stepdads and stepmoms and uh, brothers and sisters and cousins. Lord, thank you for everyone who's here today. Would you bless them? Would you speak to them? Lord, would you open their eyes to what you have for them, Lord? Maybe not for someone else, but exactly for them. Help them to open their hearts, Lord. Remove burdens of guilt, g- burdens of hurt and maybe... Um, Maybe regret, Lord, would you, would you pull those off their shoulders? Would you, would you make the burden light? Would you encourage them? Would you give them hope? Lord, we love you and we're so thankful to be here. Open our hearts to what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to jump right in. Uh, there was a, some kind of musical uh, award ceremony and a famous singer that probably most of you guys are fans of named Avril Lavigne. How many of you guys know Avril Lavigne? The famous Canadian. So all you guys are big fans, I'm, I'm guessing. Those are all the big fans in the room of Avril Lavigne. Um, she, uh, she was giving an award, and uh, it was her job to present it. And she you know, opened up the card to give the award to whatever artist was going to be announced. And she, uh, she said, uh, uh, the award goes to David Bowie. David Bowie. And in front of the, a huge audience of all these artists who all know each other and have been inspired by each other, in front of the, the watching world because of TV, um, she missed it in front of everybody. Luckily, David Bowie didn't know who Avril Lavigne was, so it was kind of even. Um, have, have you ever missed it in front of somebody? You know, like you're playing football. Maybe you guys were a sports per, you know, person and you're playing a game and, and the winning touchdown was thrown to you and you're running, you're going for it, and then you trip or you, it bounces off your hands and you miss it. The winning goal is, is right there for you. The goal's open. You've got the pass has been, has been shot to you and you're going to just put it right in the net. That's open net and you miss it or you miss the ball. Just fully miss it. How many of you guys have missed it in your life? Just totally Missed it. All right. Today's sermon is all about not missing it. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss it on the big things because we can miss some things. Like maybe, have, how many of you guys have missed like an anniversary? Like I'm talking like a monthly anniversary, not like a year anniversary. Did you guys really miss that? That's bad. You shouldn't have told us. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I, how many of you guys have missed something like an anniversary? Missing a monthly anniversary? That's okay. I'm just saying. That's okay. You're putting too much pressure on the relationship. If it's, you've got you to gotta hit that every time. But on a yearly basis, if you missed a, year, a year's anniversary you know, between a couple, that's a big deal, right? That's a fairly big deal. How about a birthday? How many of you guys have missed a birthday? You know, if it's like your son or daughter, a big deal. If it's like your niece or your, you know, your nephew, not as big a deal. But you're still going to have to make it up with some cash probably, right? You can miss some of those things. But, but the reality is we are geared as people. Isn't it true that we are geared to miss sometimes the most important things in our lives? I mean, like, I don't want to miss these things, but I know that people miss them. Uh, they miss, like, first steps. They miss first words. Um, they miss weddings or funerals for various reasons. Maybe there's hurt or there's, there's enmity. There's fighting uh, between uh, people and it causes them to miss it. Maybe there's just distraction. Maybe like work's taken over your life and so you're missing all these things you're not designed to miss. And, and, you, and you know the sad thing is when you're missing those things, you don't even really know what you're missing because you weren't there. Does that make sense? 
And I don't want you guys to miss it. There's this ancient story um, from Genesis about this guy named Jacob who was a liar. And he was in trouble because he lied. He lied to his family. And he was on the run from his family, basically, uh, because he had stolen that which wasn't his. And he lied to get it. And uh, as he's on his way, he's alone for the first time. He's suffering the consequences of separation of relationship. How many of you guys know that lying and stealing will kind of bro- break and ruin the relationship? How many of you guys know that? All right. Hopefully not her firsthand experience, but... Uh, that's what happens. So he's suffering the full ramifications. He, he's alone at night in some desert. He feels God forsaken. And the darkness settles in. His aloneness, his fear, his anxiety settles in. He just feels utterly alone. And he goes to sleep. And the, it says the only thing he has for a pillow is a rock. He's just alone. He's laying on a rock. Um, and, he, um, and he has a dream. And God visits him and speaks life to him and, and gives him a totally different vision for his life. It's like, it's just, um, it's paradigm shifting for him. And he, when he wakes up, he has this to say. He says, when he woke up, surely the Lord is in this place. I was just not aware of it. How awesome is this place? Now, was the place awesome? Or was the God who inhabited it awesome, right? I would suggest the God that filled it, that was there. See, God was already there. He just was not aware of it. How many of you guys have been walking through life unaware of God, and then all of a sudden awareness comes, and you're like, he was here the whole time. How many of you guys experienced that? There might be some of you here that are like, you're pre-faith. You're like, you're on a journey. Maybe you got invited here because, you know, your your niece or nephew or whoever's getting dedicated or a friend just said, you need to come to church. You know, the stuff going on in your life, I think the only person who can help you is God, and so you're here. But you might not believe yet. But I think in the heart of hearts, most humans, they they want God to reveal himself. Lord, if you're real, I want to encounter you. Like if I'm unaware of something, I want to become aware of it. And this, this sermon is for you. I don't want any of you to miss it. Whether you've been following Jesus for a long time and you've been just kind of going through the motions or you've been doing all sorts of things and life's crazy busy, um, I don't want you to miss the movement of God. I, don't, I want you to be aware of what he's doing. And if, you, if you've never believed in God, I want you to, to, to know how and to, to be able to experience him and not miss God. Can we agree not missing God would be important if he exists, if he's real, if he really loves you? There's a story in Mark that's unbelievable. It's uh, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and if you have a Bible, you can turn there. You can follow along behind me on the screen. And then uh, we also have these notes. If you look in in the program, I have notes for you. It's got the passages that we're going to primarily focus on. Uh, It's got the passage in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 47. And, um, and then it has notes. It's kind of fill in the blanks. This is, for, you know, this is really helpful for, I think, a lot of people in remembering things. And then um, a- as we kind of go through the, the passage, there'll be moments when um, the, the, the fill in the blank area will come across with the actual note for you. So you can follow along that way. And then if you're interested in community groups or discussing this with people, there's discussion questions that help us dig deeper um, into areas maybe we couldn't dig into today. But I just want to make you aware of that. Um, to follow along with this if, you, if you'd like. But picking up in um, the book of Mark, chapter 6, it says this, Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake. The boat was in the middle of the lake. They've, um, Jesus' disciples have been doing like some crazy cool ministry. They've just fed, like four, I think, 4,000 people, like uh, men, and that's not including all the kids and the, and the women. So they just did this amazing, miraculous uh, feeding and God likes to feed people. That's cool because I think uh, religious people like to eat. I've noticed that. They do like to eat a lot. And even non-religious people, they like to eat a lot. People like to eat. So God, uh, they, Jesus has been doing some incredible ministry, healing, providing for people, loving people, teaching them. And then his disciples go into the middle of the lake without Jesus. And it says, and he, being Jesus, was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining, like in the middle of uh, the lake. He saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to meet them walking on the lake. Just to take a moment here. I don't want us to miss some things. 
Um, when it's before dawn, what is, what's it like outside on the lake? What's it like? It's dark, right? Have you ever heard that, that saying that it's darkest before the dawn? So it's dark. It's like at one of the darkest points. And um, J- Jesus sees them and walks out to him because he sees the disciples struggling. They're in the middle of a storm. And the Sea of Galilee is the sea that they're on, this l- large lake. And there's, uh, there's a giant wind tunnel that's created by the mountains, the way the mountains are shaped around uh, the Sea of Galilee, that like in, in the moment of an, uh, uh, just the blink of an eye, wind can come down and just churn up the waters and make it like very dangerous. And, and, this, and the winds come and a storm comes and, and Jesus walks on the water. Have you ever thought about that, what that would look like? Jesus walking on the water. Do you think it was like, was the water squishy? Like it was like squish, squish. Was it, you know, like in, you know, uh, hockey, you know, that Stanley Cup's going around. Some of you guys like that. Maybe he's like skating on it. I don't know. They all feel like they can walk on the water, those Canadians and their hockey. Um, <laughs> H2O's in a solid form. It's different. And, um, well, I imagine Jesus, I think he's pretty confident walking on the water. This is the Son of God. So he comes out walking on the water, and it says he was about to pass them by. He was about to pass them by, which is really interesting. Um, New Testament scholars and theologians for years could not figure this statement out because they, they've read this story in Matthew, and they've read it from you know, some other angles. Um, Mark says he was about to pass them by. So they're like, why, 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 would, why was Jesus about to pass them by? How, how could they have missed Jesus? Did they almost miss him? And why did that happen? And you know, uh, one theologian said, you know, well, it's because Jesus wanted to pass them by so they'd see him kind of moving by them and they'd have to cry out and say, Jesus, come into the boat and help us. That's why. But that can't be why, according to Mark, because, well, let's, let's read on. It says, um, he was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. And they cried out, not because they wanted him to come into the boat, because they were terrified. How many of you guys uh, have seen a ghost? If you got, like, I mean, like, I'm sure you've seen some really pale white Washingtonians. You know, I was just talking with a, <laughs> with a guy from Texas here earlier. He's like super tan, and you know, I'm sure he looks around at all the translucent skin and says, well, that happened to me. Will I become a ghoul? Um, how many of you guys have family members that believe in ghosts? So you guys like big family members or friends or like big ghost people, you know, I ain't afraid of no ghosts, but they like them, you know. Um, I had roommates and I've had family members, but like I had roommates like in Europe and stuff and there'd be funny conversations like, we got to be like, yes, when I was eight years old, I walked into the pantry and there in the pantry was a ghost and it looked at me and it said, Manfredo, hello. We were like, what else did it say? No, that was it. Just Hello. I saw a ghost. I'm like, are you sure that wasn't like a burglar or something? Like, are you kidding me? And, uh, but the normal response, if you see anything that's like a specter, a phantom, a ghost, a ghoul, like anything that would make you think that the undead, like, like a zombie is there, like you got to run. Like you don't want that thing coming near you. If you're in a boat and it's walking on the water, you don't want that thing in the boat, right? Why is that? Because you're terrified, because you're normal. If you are like, no, that would be really cool. Something's wrong with you. Um, they were scared. They cried out because they all saw him. So why was Jesus passing him by? Well, it goes on to say in verse 50, immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. It's, it's Jesus, the Son of God, the, the, the guy you've been following, the guy that's been leading you. And he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down, the wind stopped. The storm calmed, and they were completely amazed. Now, it's pretty interesting. It goes from seeing Jesus and not understanding who he was as he's walking on the water and being terrified, like freaked out, like, what? And then realizing who it really is. It really is Jesus. And he gets in the boat, quiets the storm that they've been rowing against, they've been trying to survive through. And they're blown away. They're absolutely stunned, amazed. Like, doesn't it strike you as odd as the ones who like just fed all these people like impossibly with this miracle? 
and they've seen Jesus do all these other crazy, cool, miraculous things, cast out demons, heal people, why would they all of a sudden be blown away, shocked that this was the Lord, Jesus? I mean, when, like at some point you're like, ah, oh, it's, you know, Jesus walking on the water again, fellas. Like, <laughs> Jesus quit showing off, you know, we get it. You're the son of God. Um, why? Mark is asking us to slow down and ask, why are they shocked? Why are they so surprised? What's going on here? Why did he almost pass them by? Let me ask you guys this. Do you think that the authors of Scripture knew the Old Testament? Yeah? Knew it pretty well? Well, Theologians, New Testament scholars couldn't figure this out until they looked back at the book of Job. When you look back at the book of Job, you look in chapter 9 of Job, at verse 8 it says this about God. This is Job, who's going, the guy who's gone through all this pain, he's gone through all this loss, he's lost his family. He's in the middle of a storm and he is giving his heart, like he's revealing his heart about God and about the heavier things of life. And he says this in, in, in verse 8, he says, about God, the creator. He says, he alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the seas. What is Jesus doing in this passage? He's walking on the water. He's treading on the waves of their dread. He's walking on the water. And all of a sudden, it, like, like Mark is saying, this thing that Jesus was doing, when he, he, this is that in Job. This is that God. The creator is manifest before us in Jesus. Like, the disciples thought they knew Jesus, but all of a sudden they're, they're coming to know him at a totally different level. The one who treads on the waves. Of the sea. Have you ever, just for a moment, have you ever known someone who shocked you and surprised you? Like, you thought they were this, but then all of a sudden in a weird moment, they like, boom, came out of their shell. You know, like, all of a sudden, they, when did you get a sense of humor? Like, you know... Like, you know, since when did you start tanning, you know? I just thought that was impossible for your body. Um, it's like the Bedlians, we, we don't tan very well. Um, we had a kid in a youth group who was really quiet. He had a really bad stuttering problem. He became a freshman. I was actually younger than him. Um, but in our church, and there was this uh, youth group and had all these kids, and this, and this young kid named Devin had a stutter, and he was really kind of diminutive, small figure. And uh, God, he, most of the kids really liked him, but he didn't say much. But there were two kids that just started picking on him real bad. Would make fun of him. Yeah, that even happens in, in churches where that, you know, kids are kids. And uh, immaturity is starting to happen. And uh, they were picking on him. And one time they were on this trip, and they stopped at a rest stop. And they started picking on him and making fun of his stutter. And this little kid is like, doesn't talk much. You barely hear anything from him. Just kind of sit, standing there and they keep making fun, keep making fun. And all of a sudden, just like out of nowhere, jumps up like two feet in the air and does like this roundhouse, boom, kick to the chest of the senior who was bullying him. And in that moment, like in the chest, air leaving body, like eyes getting huge, tears coming out, hitting the ground. This realization on the way to the ground, this kid was not what he thought. <laughs> and then Devin became the hero. They were like, you sit in the front. And the seniors had to sit in the back. You just look at him and he's like, they'd be like, you don't want to let Devin kick you again, do you? And they'd be like, no. Mm. Sometimes people shock. Jesus is shocking the men who think they know him best. And if we keep reading in Job, check this out. This is incredible. It says about the one who alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. In verse 9, he is the maker of the bear and Orion, Pallades, and the constellations of the south. He, is, he has set all the stars and all the constellations and all the planets into place. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. Like God, God, this creator is so huge and so intelligent, and the creation that he's created is so big and so massive that you can't even fathom it. And when you try to, you get blown away. There's a sense of wonder, a sense of awe that happens. That's like the, one of the pieces of worship when you start realizing that, that God is God and you are not him. Have you ever had that moment? And it says this, verse 11, when he passes me, 
I cannot see Him. When He passes me, I cannot see Him. When He goes by, I cannot perceive Him. What does it say in the middle of verse 48? He was about to what? Pass them by. Mark is saying this God, who is so huge, who is so incredible, who is so vast and utter and incredible, mind-blowing, is the same God treading the waves in front of the disciples. And they're blown away because they didn't realize that aspect of Jesus. They hadn't slowed down to dwell on that aspect of Jesus. They missed it. And all of a sudden, the God who is in that place, the God who is in Jesus, they were now becoming aware of. Where in your life is maybe God trying to make you aware of him? And why is it so easy to miss God? Why is it easy? I'm not just talking like atheists and agnostics. I have friends and there's people here that are like, I'm not a believer yet. And that's, that's okay. I'm glad you're here and I, I appreciate uh, your perspective. But there's this reality that it's not just people who are like, I don't believe in God. Christians miss the movement of God all the time. Look at the disciples almost missed him. He walked by them on the water. Like how, how, how obvious does it get? Why do we miss God? Why do we struggle seeing him at times? Well, if we backed up into verse 47 of Mark again, I think it gives us a better picture of what's going on. To the God that when he passes by, we, trouble see, we have trouble seeing him. When he, when he goes by us, we, tr- we have trouble perceiving, wrapping our minds around him. How do you fathom the unfathomable? How do you um, comprehend the incomprehensible? You're speaking in paradox, Pastor. Is this helpful? Watch this. This is incredible. Verse 47, later that night, going back to in the story, that night, remember it's dark. The boat was in the middle of the lake. Uh, uh, he was alone on land. Jesus watching. He saw the disciples straining at the oars, trying to, to get away when it was pitch black. He saw the disciples through the wind that was blowing over. He saw the disciples through all the waves. He saw the disciples in all of their... Um, distraction and all of their worry and all of their anxiety. You see, we we serve a God who isn't just trying to pass us by. He sees us and he's walking to us. In fact, in this passage, Jesus sees us through the darkness even when we can't see Jesus through our darkness. Amen? Amen? Isn't that, isn't that true? Like, isn't that, like, that's incredible that we can have darkness, that we can have storms, that we can have waves in our life. We can have anxiety upon anxiety. We can have worry upon worry. We can have um, distraction of work, distraction of family, distraction of relationships. We can have everything going wrong in our life and not be able to see God. I'm talking Christians. I'm talking middle of the road Christians. I'm talking people far from God. Like, you're lucky the building isn't burning down because you're here or whatever. We all can miss him. Because of those things, let me ask you a question. What, what wind are you struggling against in your life? Are you rowing against and you're getting nowhere without God? And you try and you, and you keep convincing yourself, I'll be able to move forward, I'll be able to get this, and you try and you try, but it's not working. What waves are coming against you? What waves of anxiety or hurt or brokenness or sin or regret keep washing at at the boat and keep threatening to sink your life and are distracting you from seeing the one who walks on the waves is also the one who created the waves. Is the one who, who can see through your storm. He can see through your darkness. He can see through your waves even when you can't see him. He can see through your hurt. He can see through your posturing, through your pride. He can see the inner kid that's really struggling in you. He sees you. He sees through it all. He sees you. It blows me away. Why do we struggle seeing God? See, God can see through all that stuff, but we're humans. We often see life from our perspective rather than seeing from God's perspective. 
And the Bible, what, what Mark's trying to do, he's trying to slow us down. He's trying to say, slow down and read this. Slow down and think about this. Slow down and look deeper. Slow down and dwell on the mystery of God. Slow down so that you can begin to start seeing from God's perspective. Guys, that's why God gave us the Bible. That's why God gives us truth. That's why he wants to change our lives so we can stop thinking only from a human perspective, only see the waves that are in front of us and begin to see Jesus. Amen? Am I preaching to you? Why do we struggle with this? He was about to pass them by. And notice... Uh, it says that they were terrified because they thought it was a, a ghost. They thought he was a ghost. How many of you guys, when, when you've started to sense a little bit of God in your life, not the religious stuff, not like the, you know, you, should, you have to do this and don't do this and the rules. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying the rules and things like that are, have no place because if you've ever raised a kid, you've got to have some rules, right, because they're going to do some dumb things. God has to, you know, he knows we're going to do some dumb things, so there's some basics. But... I'm not talking about you know, man-made religion. I'm talking about God himself. Have you ever had God start moving in your life and your reaction was terror? It's like a ghost coming at you. Stay, stay away from me, God. Because I think sometimes the terror comes from a few things. Initially, initially, when we're looking from our perspective, not God's perspective, when our hearts aren't opened fully yet, and we don't really realize who Jesus is and who God is, because we mistake Jesus for a set of rules, we mistake Jesus for religion, we mistake him for some strange lady who's always judging us, and, and Jesus was this guy who created this religion of all these people that, that just are good at judging people. Maybe that's your perspective, and that's why you're a little terrified. Or maybe, just maybe, you've got this boat, and you've got like all the stuff you kind of like, even though you're in a storm, you've got your, you've got your money, even though you're in a storm, you've got your work, you've got your purpose, you've got your accomplishments, you've got all the things you need to be successful, and the boat's rocking like crazy, but you don't want Jesus to come in because you're gonna have, you might have to give some of that stuff up. How many of you guys have been scared because of that? I don't know that I want to recognize that God is passing through my life, and this moment is passing, and it's an opportunity, but I'm freaked out of my mind. I'm terrified like the disciples because it might mean I have to let Jesus into my boat, into my life. I might have to give up some stuff. I might have to give up some anger. I might have to give up some of my other anxieties and fears. And isn't it interesting that sometimes the storm that, we, that is scaring us and freaking us out is the storm that we feel we need because we get so used to it in our lives. And we get more connected to the storm than the creator of the storm. Um, why don't you let Jesus in the boat? Why don't we let him in the boat? Why do we get so scared? And the last thing I wanted to mention about this is that sometimes I think um, we can't comprehend him and humans are always afraid of what we don't understand. And we want like this God that we can explain. We want this God, like, like if I could just put it under a microscope, if I could figure out everything about God, and if I could just get him like, in this tight box, theologically or scientifically and empirically, if I could just figure everything out, then I wouldn't have any need to be afraid of him because then I could kind of control him a little bit. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, having him get in the boat isn't so bad because he's contained. See, and that's less scary. But humans are always afraid of what they don't understand. Don't we get afraid? Like, I mean, I have, I've got some nephews in, uh, in our family now, and they're crazy, and they scare the heck out of me. I don't understand them. They're running around here and there, and they're crazy, making crazy decisions. That scares me a little bit. It scares me a little bit. But uh, here's the thing. The, the storm won't quiet unless we let Jesus in the boat, unless we let Jesus into our life. The storms will not ever fully go away unless the creator of the water that is being walked upon, unless the director of the winds, unless the light that shines in only darkness is brought into the boat, is brought into your life. Don't miss him, guys. Don't miss him. Don't let him pass you by. 
Right? God is walking to you, but it is us who let him pass by because we're afraid, afraid. I had a friend who's an atheist. He said his greatest fear, he was in a moment of vulnerability. We'd talk, we'd talk we're good friends, um, grew up together, and he had all sorts of arguments on why God doesn't exist and you know, uh, why God hasn't revealed himself and therefore he, there is no God and all this stuff. But in a moment of vulnerability, he said, you know what my, my biggest fear is? I said, no, what's your biggest fear? So my biggest fear is that, that I'm missing it. And that maybe God does exist. That maybe God is real. And I've just been focusing on the wrong things. He's like, I know it can't be, but I, there's this fear in my gut. I'll wake up sometimes. or moments of honesty. God will. I'm afraid that I'm wrong. And I was like, that doesn't sound very atheistic, man. But I can understand that. I can respect that. That honesty, that realness. And instead of needing to explain God, what if we just enjoyed him? You know? Like, what if like we'd take Mark's, what Mark's trying to do is with the text, what Mark's trying to do with the connection to Job and what he's trying to do with the stars and, and teach us about God's creation. He's saying, slow down, son. Slow down, daughter, slow down to look and to listen deeper. Instead of going a million miles a minute, just go, 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 and focus on this, this. Slow down. Slow down and dwell on the mysteries of God. I want you guys to, would you play that video real quick? I want us to just look at this as we close. Um. In Job, it says, he alone stretches out the heavens. Isn't that beautiful? These are actual pictures of our solar system. I mean, it's unreal. He treads the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, Pleiades, and the constellations. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed. Can you fathom this? Can you fathom the distance, distances between stars? how they're formed, the atomic structures of them, why they're there in the first place, how they got... Can you fathom that? Can any one person say, oh, I've, I've figured this whole thing out. The Creator created this. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. When He passes me, I cannot see him, and when he goes by, I cannot perceive him. Sometimes it's dark, and we don't see him. Sometimes there's, there's wind, and there's waves. There's life happening. We get scared. We only, maybe we see just a piece of Jesus, and we think it's a ghost, and we're terrified. We don't want him to come in the boat. At the end of this story, Jesus says to the disciples, they don't understand, they can't fathom him. Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died. What would you do? How would you feel if the guy says, don't be afraid, steps in the boat and the storm just goes, Phew. my terror like level would go up about, I don't know, a thousand but it would be a different kind of terror because I, I, I know him. And he's powerful, but I know him. He's powerful, but he loves people. He's powerful, but he serves people. And it says they were completely amazed. When was the last time you were absolutely amazed with God? That you allowed yourself to just be like, I don't understand this. It's just incredible slow down look more deeply dwell on the mysteries of God don't miss him don't miss him let's pray Jesus we love you we're so thankful for you your work in our lives Lord I'm so thankful that when we can't see you through the storm when we can't see you through the dark Lord you see us and you move to us. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't allow you to move through our lives, to pass through our lives without, 
seeing and perceiving just a piece of you. Lord, we don't have to understand every bit of you. I don't even understand my wife all the time. (laughs) But I love her. I pray for that person that's here that feels like they have to like understand you and like put you in a microscope so that they can trust in you, Lord, and, and realize that that's not how relationships work. That love is so much bigger than any, than, than, uh, any microscope could ever pick up on, than any, any scientific tool could ever pick up on. Lord, we are souls. We are eternal beings created by you. We can't pick that up with the best science technology. We can only pick that up with our hearts. I pray that, we, that you would be in this place and that the reality is that you've always been in, in the place of our life. And we just are becoming aware of it. And may we trust you more. May we love you. May we slow down and see you and not miss you. Amen.